Welcome to a new edition of the Neon Jazz Interview Series with Toronto-born, New York City-based guitarist Alex Goodman. He opens up about his vividly evocative double album, Impressions in Blue and Red, featuring two distinct quartets, and it came out right around when the world was going into full coronavirus quarantine shutdown mode on March 13th, 2020. We spoke about this new world and so much more, so please get to know this project and dig this interview. I guess we're all probably feeling... Somewhere on this this spectrum of of, of emotions, we're we're teeter tottering. I'm sure it's crazy. Yeah, it's a crazy time. That's Man, for sure. I, I don't. I, I think the thing that's probably the most unique about all of this is is that you know anything that's probably happened in our lifetimes, you could compare it to another generation. Yeah. That there's literally no generation, no species that has probably ever gone through something like this. On an entire Earth scale, it's it's rather odd and wild at the same time. But I figured my my goal with reaching out because um, I had originally kind of thought maybe I was going to just lay low. Uh, yeah, I think it's probably better for all of us to talk about what makes things make sense anyway. <laughs> so yeah, I figured it'd be better to interview about it. So are you up? Are you up in New York? Correct. I am, yeah. Okay, all right. So what, you know, that's the thing, I guess, about what we read here, you know, in the Midwest and what we're all kind of getting. What's your sense of how everything's going up there? It's pretty well. I mean, so I've been sheltering in place for a while now with my wife. So I'm not really going outside. I mean, I do read up quite a bit on it. Um so, I mean, from that, your perspective is probably the same as mine because I'm not really leaving the apartment. <laughs> um, it, yeah, I, I, I think. I mean, I think it's pretty bad. It's growing really quickly. I think there is like some competent leadership that's kind of like guiding um, the state through it, but it's yeah. it's really bad. It's, I mean, it's it's really progressing quickly and and. Um, there's a lot of people that are in a lot of danger. Um, you don't really see it because at this point everybody's just kind of staying home, but you know it's there. Yeah. Um, what you do, what I do know is like how it hits the musicians community. And it's, I mean, it's like pretty unbelievable. I mean, um, everybody is just has no idea what to do right now or how they're going to go forward. Um, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I can speak mostly from my own experience um, because you end up being so isolated from other people. It's hard to even know. I know, you, you, like, I'm staying in touch with a lot of people and I have a good network of friends, but it's like you don't really know the particulars of how it's affecting everyone. And yeah. I'm actually worried about a lot of the people that I'm not in touch with, like, that are not, like, I'm not as close to in my, like, immediate friend group because you only have so much bandwidth to be in touch with everyone. Um, but I, there's just so many people that are just like not prepared for something like this. It's already so precarious to be a musician in New York, and yeah. then to go through something like this. Like, I don't know if everyone is going to be able to sustain the same thing in New York anymore. Like, I think a lot of people. It's it's just gonna it's gonna force people to make a lot of different decisions in their life. Well, yeah, and you know the interesting thing before all of this happened, I was thinking about. Um, you know, Bobby Watson's getting ready to retire from UMKC, and mm-hmm. we had a long conversation before all of this began, probably in the first week of March before we knew any of this was going to happen. And we were just talking about how Kansas City's always been seen as a springboard, but lately, because of him and because of what's going on and the cost of living, a lot of people have either stayed or come here, like Adam Larson. Right. And that's the thing that I think might be a part of a plan for people if, yeah. you know, there is a fear um, that they can come. But I think, you know, the one thing I'm starting to hear, I'm, I'm interviewing a lot of people, is hopefully the appreciation and surge after this from a live audience is going to be a different kind of animal. I hope so. I'm worried about people not having money to yeah. use, you know, to spend on um, activities like that. It's just, it's hard to know where this is going 
financially, like in terms of the economic fallout. Um, True. And it's just like, and it's so unknown how long it's going to be. Yeah, um, but I, I think you're right. Like, I mean, I think this is just going to expedite this digital shift. And like already you can see like people are just having to figure it out and to shift. And uh, I don't think people really know what to do at the moment, but it, it's just going to speed up that process of like connecting people outside of um, physical locations. So, I mean, I think yeah. there's going to be, it's going to make that a bigger part of the whole um, kind of musician's formula. And uh, I think that will mean that people will leave. I think people will be, you know, settling in, in other places as a result. Yeah, unfortunately, because I know that from what I've heard, you know, I guess Brooklyn's a little better than actually in Manhattan, but it's still expensive. I mean, it's, Brooklyn's yeah. probably grown enough that, you know, it's not a huge, massive break. But, yeah, it's, you know, and I think about that with all of the businesses and everything that's going on. I mean, I know it's real facetious for anybody to say that everything's going to be back full scale after Easter. Yeah. There's a part of all of this too, that in a very weird way, I know it's, I know it's not true, but in a very weird way, I got a very bright, a very small spoke of hope because we haven't heard anything like, okay, this is it. Like for instance, here in Missouri, you know, I work in a school district, and they are already saying now that hopefully we can come back the weekend after the 24th of April. That's their right. hope, you know. Right. And and everybody's sanitizing and cleaning and being yeah. proactive. And, you know, and, and I really do notice here in Kansas City, I can tell you 100% for sure, I am an outside creature. I'm, I, I'm a very mobile yeah. human being, and no one's out, like, like it's yeah. strange. Like there's grocery stores and necessity, but when I drive around and look at what's going on, like I just moved from a very a relatively small town to Pat Matheny's hometown at Lee Summit, and Lee Summit's an actually pretty bustling area, and it's dead. It's a ghost town. So huh. I know on our end, if we're talking about taking that curve and slicing it, yeah, I have every single bit of confidence that that's happening here. It has yeah. to, and if it's yeah. not. I, my eyes are deceiving me. I think in New York, it's just so challenging because it's so dense. Oh man. Yeah. yeah. It's just, it's like, it's just going to be so hard to control it. It's just such a perfect storm. Yeah. It's, it's unknown. You know, we just, we just don't know where it's all, where it's all going. Um, yeah. But, you know, staying positive and, and that helps get through it. And um, yeah. Without a doubt. Yeah. I did speak to somebody in, in New Orleans yesterday mm. And it's really literally a matter right now of them kind of um, just that moment before the tornado. You know, I don't know that he he was even able to, you know, to articulate much of what he thought was going to happen but beyond, you know, they had that big Mardi Gras and no one really knew. And it's like, know. you know, so we'll, we'll see. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yes, yeah that's, wild. that's wild. We'll dive into Rose, your things here. Alex, thanks for taking a minute out for Neon Jazz. I know we're catching back up. We've spoken before, so it's great to catch up with you about this new project. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for doing this. You bet. So um, your your latest double album, Impressions in Blue and Red, featuring two distinct quartets. Talk to me a little bit about this project and, you know, kind of how it came about and how you feel about how it ended up. Mm-hmm. Um, I worked on this project for quite some time. I was probably kind of advising it for about two years. And the original idea came to me because I realized that I was associating different compositions kind of subconsciously with different colors for my whole life, pretty much. Um, there was just some things that I would, if I thought of that piece uh, or a certain musician, I would kind of store it away um, with a color associated with it. And I never really thought anything of it, but um, at one point it kind of clicked that this was even happening. And it just got me really interested in that process. It got me really interested in why I would be doing that and what it would mean to subconsciously be assigning colors. So I started thinking about, well, what would the musical qualities of those pieces or those artists be, and what would that mean if it was assigning a color and why would that color be assigned? What are the musical qualities that correlate to um, these specific colors? So it just it kind of started this whole process. Uh, I'm I really like visual art. I like going to museums and 
I like um, just checking out a lot of different artists from a lot of different times. And so it just kind of made me go to a lot of places and, and look at art through the prism of looking at them through the prism of color, which was an interesting process because it just made me think about visual art differently. And uh, I started writing a lot of music, kind of working backwards from that process of I would isolate um, use of color that I really liked by different artists in, in their artwork, and I would kind of store, throw them away. I kind of had this catalog going. And then I would reference those pieces, and I would kind of write a piece based on their use of color in, in that artwork. So I wrote all this music um, based on the color, use of the colors blue and red. So I kind of had two different bodies of music. So for me, conceptually, they were both linked. So I kind of wanted to release them together um, because there was a relationship between the two bodies of work, even though they were kind of coming from a different inspiration point. And uh, that was kind of the process for the whole thing coming about. I, I came up with two quartets. I, I thought of musicians that I associated um, musically with, with the colors of the album that they were on. And the exploration was writing this music and then actually recording it with these two different groups of musicians and uh, just seeing, seeing what the results were in the end. You know, it's interesting that notion of taking art and turning it into a musical project. I was talking to Jason Palmer yesterday, and he was doing one in memory of that big, huge heist at that museum in Boston. Mm. And all of the paintings that were taken, he did a suite memorializing each of those because to this day, 30 years later, they still have empty frames up there where they're at. <laughs> and it's still a massive mystery. They are no clearer as to where it's at versus where they were when they were stolen, but they're hopeful. <laughs> so uh, it, it is interesting to weave those two worlds together. Um, so, you know, I know there was, you know, I guess the interesting thing about this is that it was actually released on the 13th, and that's about when all of this kind of began. <laughs> is there anything that you're thinking in your mind right now in retrospect that's poignant about, you know, kind of the release of this album prior to all of this and where we're all at and where we're going to be, hopefully, after you be, you're able to play shows to memorialize and celebrate this album? Well, it's challenging um, because... These days, the way to sell CDs is on tour, and the tour dates for the CD are getting really compromised. Um, so we had release dates in May and a lot of release dates in June. Uh, I was supposed to be going to Europe for two and a half weeks to do a release tour. Um, I'm supposed to play at Canadian festivals, uh, and I had other dates throughout Canada in May. A lot of things are already canceled, and, and I, I wonder where it's all leading. So that's definitely challenging because a project like this, um, you're also kind of for a couple of years setting it in motion by organizing release dates to make sure that you can get it out there. And, um, you know, despite the plans to have that in place, it just seems like it's kind of disappearing. So that's hard just in terms of getting the music out there. So it just becomes more important um, to connect with people digitally and, and hopefully – you know, still sell copies through, you know, my my website and, and uh just online because that's um that's the way to get it out there and we've been moving towards that but this just really kinda expedites that process of, of really needing to rely on connecting with people digitally because um everything that's in place is just kinda not there. So so that's definitely a challenge. You know, I guess that's something I just didn't realize until we were talking right now, and that's very true. You know, I've always thought, because I get CDs in the mail all the time throughout the week between yeah. 5 to 10. I mean, it's dried up lately, but that's been kind of a consistent thing, and I always find it comforting, but I come from an older school. You know, I'm in my mid yeah. to late 40s, and that's just what I'm used to. But I think the one rub that I hear from musicians is, you know, the share of the digital market is so low, you almost have to have physical. But at the end of the day, maybe this will force people – where if you're at a show, you have a card that has a, a promo code and they can pay. Some, something that might revolutionize the way that jazz musicians finally get their fair share of what they should get from the music they put out there. I hope so. I definitely hope so, yeah. In my experience, um, it's mostly been probably actually touring in Europe where I've sold most of the CDs. Um, 
And it's hard to replicate that. At the same time, like, I can also see the writing on the wall. I, I believe that, um, you know, the days for that are probably numbered. I mean, most people don't even have a CD player anymore. So yeah. <laughs> I, I think it's like the twilight years of being able to do that. So I think, you yeah. know, this, this might speed it up a little, but it definitely is making musicians confront this situation and think about what they have to do. And that probably will speed up the solutions. Um, it is challenging though because typically the the amount that you can make from it so far has just been just been not as high. Yeah. Well, you know, I know with even with movies now they're releasing them right to video or right to yeah. you know Amazon or whatever, and that's 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 great because you know that's going to make it easier for everybody. But I guess that's the thing about you know music. You know, hopefully. Everybody always gets weird about the newer technologies that get in there, and it seems to me as digital is going to be around for a long time. It makes more mm -hmm. sense, you know. And I guess the unfortunate thing with services like, you know, iTunes and, and Spotify is that you just don't – you're just not going to make that much money if you don't get thousands of hits. You know? Yeah, yeah. And yet there is potential. You know, I mean, you have this tool to be able to connect with everyone, and that is valuable. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it's it's – Hopefully, we can move towards finding a viable kind of digital option. So let's go ahead and kind of segue into my uh, – let me ask one more question about the album. Yeah. And I kind of ask you a recollection of things now. What do you hope that the listener gets from this experience? What do you want them to get when they listen to it the first time and they can keep listening to it after that? Yeah, I mean, I hope people just connect with the music. Uh, I hope people have their own experience. Um, it's difficult for me to kind of like assign the experience that I would want them to have. Uh, I put a lot of thought into the music, and um, there was this kind of conceptual inspiration. But at the end of the day, now that it's done, I kind of just put it out there, and um, I feel happy about the music that was created. But I just I I kind of like pass that off to other people to. Um, have their own connection with it. Uh, and so I, I hope, uh, I think it's, it's very variable from person to person. So I think uh, it could be very different for, for everyone. And it's hard for me to kind of come up with a kind of my own kind of conception of what that should be. Let's be hopeful here. I think that's the yeah. key to all of this is that we can look past all of this and how good that's going to actually be. And my question to you is this. What do you hope the live audience will, will, will gain from this time of absence when they finally do get to get immersed back into a live jazz world? What are you hoping happens? Not only just from a mm -hmm. New York perspective, but from a global jazz, go out, listen to music perspective. Yeah, I, I hope people, when we do return, um, do turn to those kind of, uh, social public environments where you're appreciating art. I, I just think that they're so powerful and um, I hope that people appreciate it now that they've gone through a um, period of time where they haven't had it. Uh, I hope people, um, I hope, I hope that this experience also maybe like brings to the public consciousness of the situation of the modern musician. And, and you can see that people are, um, going out of their way to support musicians. And I think that's really good. And I think people um, continue to think about that and also continue to support musicians and go see their music and make a connection with their music live. Um, and I think there's like this opportunity right now, as difficult as it is, like people have to kind of fill up their days and find out what their interests and passions are to the best of their ability to kind of keep them happy and sane through <laughs> being kind of cooped up and I think music is really powerful for that so I think there is a good opportunity for people to discover music that they love to discover new music to find artists that they connect with to learn more about jazz or whatever music they're really interested in I think that's a really cool opportunity to kind of dive deeper into music and then when all this gets back to normal to also go experience it yeah absolutely I know personally for me I've been pretty good about trying to do that here in Kansas City, so it's very strange, you know. It's just, uh, yeah, it's weird, you know, because really the scene here has been kind of going through a renaissance for some time. I started the show in 2011, and 
seems like every year since then, there's just been so many positive, great things. The scene's good. All these cats are, are working every single night. I mean, there's, right. there's, a, you know, there's a weekly radio show on our local community radio called KKFI, and they have a two-hour block from one to three every day. And when they read that calendar, it just goes on for minutes and minutes and minutes. And it's like, wow. wow. You know, that's Kansas awesome. City Blue. Yeah, so... You know, hopefully, that, that's the thing I think about all of this at the end of the day, is that hopefully all of these businesses will have true safety nets from this stimulus package and from just life in general to have a level of forgiveness so that everything can get back to where it needs to get back to, because that's that's going to be the big thing. I hope so. Yeah. 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 So, I'm also dying to come to Kansas City. I've heard great things, and I know there's some really excellent musicians there. Um, yeah, and, and I want to eat and, barbecue. <laughs> oh man, you got to. It's, that's a must. Yeah, Kansas City is oh, yeah. a pretty cool little place, and it's one of those things that I don't think people think about as much around the globe. Well, hey, Alex, thank you again. I appreciate it. Thanks so much. Really appreciate it. Thanks for listening and tuning in to another Neon Jazz interview, where we give you a bit of insight into the finest players in Toronto, Kansas City, New York City, and spots all over the world giving fans all that jazz. And thanks to Alex for his dedication to jazz and all of that music. If you want to hear more interviews, go to Famous Interviews with Joe Domino in the iTunes store. Visit Neon Jazz at YouTube.com. And for everything Neon Jazz all the time, go to the neonjazz.blogspot.com. Until next time, enjoy the jazz, my friends. Neon Jazz.